Good afternoon, and welcome to the Tuesday Explorers, a series of lifelong learning opportunities brought to you by AARP Virginia. I'm Larry Lippman, a volunteer community ambassador with AARP Virginia. AARP is here to make your voice heard and to provide information and resources on the issues that matter to you and to connect you with fun learning opportunities. We provide valuable educational, informational, and fun resources. Things like webinars, teletown halls, discounts, and more. When it's safe to host in-person events, you'll be invited to attend. But in the meantime, AARP will continue to offer programs virtually. I'd like to thank my co-host and helper today, Trudy Morata. Like me, Trudy is a volunteer community ambassador with AARP Virginia. She'll be monitoring the chat box. We'll have time today for Q&A and comments at the end of today's presentation. So please submit your comments and questions in the chat box. Right now, everyone is on mute, but during at the end of the presentation, we will uh, unmute and let you have the opportunity to ask questions at the end. Our guest speaker today is Chuck Roche, the author of Imperfect Union, a father's search for his son in the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg. Like the central figure of his book, Chuck is a longtime Washington correspondent, and he has two adult sons. Chuck was one of the original long form cover story writers at USA Today at its startup in 1982. And for many years after that, he was a national political correspondent and columnist for USA Today's parent, Gannett. He has had bylines from 49 states and four continents. The journalist that didn't meet Chuck is going to want to know what the 50th state was. <laughs> Chuck retired uh, as the Washington correspondent for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch in 2019 and is currently writing another book. So Chuck, let's turn right now to your book. There have been dozens, if not hundreds, of books written about the Civil War and particularly the Battle of Gettysburg. What makes your book different and how did you come to write it? And tell us more about it. Uh, good question and thank you for having me today. I really look forward to our discussion over the next, uh, next hour or so. Um, my uh, assignment in uh, the spring of 2013 was uh, when I was with USA Today was to go to Gettysburg and write about the 150th anniversary of Gettysburg. Uh, they wanted a cover story about, you know, where Gettysburg was today and kind of the history and the memory of it. And honestly, I didn't think it was that good of an assignment because like you, Larry, I thought, you know, everything had been, had been written on top of everything about the battle. A lot of it written by participants in the battle, many of whom thought they won the battle single-handedly. Um, but my, my, when I got up there, uh, and, and, and a videographer and a photographer spent three days with me up there, and we were doing all the requisite things, talking to the folks that ran the, you know, that run the, that great uh, uh, park that we have there and the National Military Cemetery that's so uh, reverential when you, when you visit. And, um, I, you know, at the end of the third day, I was, kind of, I was kind of getting panicky because I wasn't really coming up with anything fresh. Uh, and then, so we decided to take one last um, kind of hike up to the top of uh, Little Round Top, uh, very famous part of the battlefield, which I'm sure you're going, you know, uh, many of you uh, know about and have seen movies about. Um, and we got up there and there were all the, this, the usual school groups and kids climbing on the rocks and looking down and, you know, doing what school kids do. And then for some reason, uh, this group of three, three people, two elderly people, and obviously, which I found out later, their son, were kind of off to the side, and they were looking at something that looked very precious to them, and it looked very um, solemn, in, 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 they looked very solemn in their, in their comportment. So I went over there, and as reporters do, I, I said, would you mind if I asked you what you were doing here and, and talking about it? And and they, and they didn't mind at all. In fact, they were very uh, expressive about what they were doing there. And, they, and what they were doing there is they were going through the diary of, a, of an ancestor, a young man who in family lore had uh, very great promise, was very well uh, liked by his family and in his community. They were from Vermont. They were dairy farmers. And that young man who was their ancestor had been killed at Gettysburg on the third day. And they actually had his diary with him. And they were going through his final steps. He'd written up to July 2nd of 1863. The battle ended on July 3rd um, at, at the end of the day. 
And uh, at that moment, I, it, I, it was sort of an aha moment for me. And I, and I thought that is proof positive that war ends, but the aftermath of war continues forever. It, it affects families in ways that we sometimes don't know. And so it really struck me at that moment that, that this was a good topic to look at. What happened not during Gettysburg or even leading into Gettysburg, it's what happened after Gettysburg. And one of the most famous stories that, would ne that had never really been told in detail was about a New York Times correspondent by the name of Sam Wilkson, who came to the battle on the first day, was told that his son, who was the youngest artillery officer in the Union Army, uh, had been bravely wounded on the first day um, on behind, and was behind Confederate lines. And they don't know what happened to him or whatever. And so my book is about his search for his son while he's reporting this battle and while he ends up writing what a lot of people think is one of the best battlefield dispatches, I personally think it's the best battlefield dispatch I've ever read uh, about what happened on the third day at Gettysburg. Um, he, he went into the first and second days here very seriously, but on, and it, it appeared in the New York Times on July 7th, uh, 1863. So that's my book. Uh, and I use that family as a way to uh, write about what was happening with the war correspondence. This was the first major war, except for the Crimean War about uh, five or six years earlier, where newspapers had really uh, sent a lot of correspondence to cover them and they were embedded with the armies. And so this really was the rise of the, of the war correspondent and all of that we know from it since then, from Ernie Pyle to the five o'clock folly reporters in, in Vietnam to the embeds with people in Iraq and Afghanistan, sort of all were predicated from that moment. So um, anyway, that's kind of what, you know, that's the background of it. And so we'll go into now what I think some of the, some of the big takeaways from my book are, and also just my general perception of, um, you know, what, how the civil war and, and the rise of the war correspondent began then and how it affects what, you know, what happens today when we cover our wars. So. I think the best way to start start this is um, by a war correspondent himself. Um, his name was Charlie Coffin. He was with the Boston Herald, and after the Battle of Antietam, he wrote what we what we see here on the screen, and that is, when the soldiers are seeking rest, the work of the or army correspondent begins. And you can read it now. All through the days, the eyes and ears are open. The notebook is scrawled with characters intelligible, um, you know, only to you if you read it. In, 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 in a quick manner. Um, and then, you know, he ends this great quote by saying, you know, I'm, I'm out there interviewing generals who, uh, or captains or generals who thinks his brigade or colonels who thinks his regiment or every captain his company uh, did most of the fighting. And so, uh, but I think there's a key phrase in here and that is the probable truth. He, he talks about the probable truth. And we'll get into that a little bit as we go along here. It's, you know, I also see, I've seen it, um, you know, referred to as the fog of war and whatever. So uh, keep that in your mind as we go along in, in the discussion in the Q&A here today. Um, I, 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 there's many ways to draw parallels to today, but um, I think, you know, one of the ways that we can start is talking about communications and technology. Uh, it came amid a revolution in communications and, and mobility in this country that, that, that rival anything that we've seen over the last 20 years with the internet. Um, eight of 10 Americans lived in rural areas at the beginning of the Civil War, but they were, uh, the media were, were increasingly concentrating in urban centers, particularly uh, in New York. Um, and war correspondents as a result were challenged on multiple fronts. And as we'll get into a little bit later, um, you know, the United States was really, really rapidly becoming what the Census Bureau, it just weeks before 1863 in a special report, said was becoming a, um, a uniquely newspaper reading nation. And it put out this entire report about how newspapers were helping to bring literacy to the country and were taking old debates, um, you know, that were once the province of kings and royalty and whatever, and democratizing them. And newspapers were really, really uh, a central to this and central to, um, you know, an American population that was, you know, getting into compulsory education and that sort of thing. And it's hard to underestimate, um, you know, the, the impact that newspapers were having on the country. And as we'll see here, in 1840, America had 17 million people and 1,404 newspapers. 20 years later, it had three times as many people, 
or three times as many uh, newspapers almost. And uh, today with 10 times the population, that's the United States actually has fewer newspapers than it did in 1840. And as I said earlier, the biggest and the most influential were concentrating in New York, setting a trend that we still see in America that uh, um, you know, has been going on uh, for 160 years, uh, the concentration of our, our national media in a couple of places. And part of that was because of the, the rise of the war. And, uh, um, and that started the concentration and really moved it along in, in these media centers in New York, Washington, and other places. Uh, there also, you know, part of this story also is the fact that, you know, the United States was getting a lot more mobile, 50,000 miles of telegraph had been put up in, the, you know, in the United States over the previous 17 years, 33,000 miles of railroad. The United States actually built 2,500 miles of railroad during the Civil War, so it was still building railroads. So the country in itself was getting a lot more um, uh, nationalized in both its media and in its travel. Um, it, as I mentioned earlier, the Crimean War, uh, uh, you know, the, the war correspondence was being invented sort of under fire because, you know, by, by nature of the beast, you have to be where the war is going on um, to do this. But um, it, it's interesting, and I use this analogy here, the War of 1812 ended with the Treaty of Ghent, and um, the Pent what we consider in our history books as sort of the, one of the seminal battles of the War of 1812, the Battle of New Orleans, which made Andrew Jackson famous, uh, was actually fought two weeks after the treaty was signed. But news of that battle didn't, um, you know, come to the United or didn't come to the capital here for about two weeks. It, it came actually, I think it came by ship around uh, Florida. And my point being is that that was only fifty or so years or sixty or so years before the Civil War. By the time of the Battle of Gettysburg on July first, second, and third of eighteen sixty three. There were instant, almost instantaneous reports coming out of that battlefield from correspondents who could get out and get to, uh, to uh, you know, to their uh, telegraph lines. And so this whole issue of immediate exclusivity in reporting, in other words, you got to get it fast and you got to get it right. But, you know, it, it, what sells it also is that you've got what nobody else has got. Uh, was really driving news over the, those, that period. And they were doing this in a period where they were having to try to figure out what was going on in the battlefields and in our political uh, you know, institutions in Washington and Richmond and other places. Um, and the other thing that I think we need to keep in mind here also is that there were new rituals of mass media consumption that were just being born in the war because of the war. And, and I, can, I, I can picture the image here and picture it in your mind, the image of people gathering at newspaper offices and at telegraph offices in the morning um, and you know, every morning to go over casualty lists from the front. And um, in, in this whole concept of mass media consumption, I think, you know, to a large degree began with that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of activity. Um, you know, the life of a correspondent was, was, was pretty darn interesting. Um, the main character in my book Sam, is, was, was Sam Wilkson. Um, he was a, a very interesting man. He was, uh, uh, he was married to the wife of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Before the war, he was a very, um, a strong abolitionist. Um, he believed that the war uh, needed to be fought to the bitter end. He was, he was one of what they called at the time a bitter ender. In his words, no matter what it took, uh, because it, it, was the, it was the moment to, to wipe out the scourge of, of slavery. Um, but it almost cost him his life. Um, he got a really bad case of dysentery uh, sleeping on the ground uh, in, in Southern Virginia during the Peninsula Campaign of 1862. And, um, and there's a story of him, you know, going back, uh, actually one of his colleagues uh, going back to New York after all, he almost died um, in, in attempt in, um, in, in Southern Virginia during the same campaign and went back to New York had, wearing the same clothes that he'd worn for like 35 straight days or something, going back into his newspaper office and uh, trying to file a story in New York and the editor's jumping all over him uh, because he didn't have, um, you know, he, he, he missed a scoop or something. And so, it, you know, the, the point is, is that it was a very hard life. Um, and Sam Wilkson, who's, who was considered probably one of the best correspondents of his time, worked for the New York Tribune and Horace Greeley, uh, was, you know, was, um, uh, took long periods of the war to go home and recuperate and then get back to the front. 
Um, but the, what the, I think the story that tells from my book that, that tells, tells the most about the challenges and the, the lengths to which um, uh, correspondence went in, in the um, Civil War to get a story out happened during the Battle of um, Fredericksburg in December of 1862. And those of you who know Civil War history probably better than I know it was a very bad defeat for the Union Army. Um, the general at the time, um, Burnside, uh, uh, he, was, he was the general of the month, uh, kept sending soldiers in waves up uh, to, um, you know, to be slaughtered on the hills at, at Fredericksburg. And, um, and Henry Villard was a, was a German immigrant who came to this country in 1855, um, left, uh, left Germany to, to settle here, earn, learn English um, in those 10 years, and became a correspondent for the uh, New York Tribune, Horace Greeley's paper, and uh, he said, um, and he he re he reported he he had a report that he wanted to get out. But the problem is Burnside had had basically imprisoned all the correspondence with the Union Army with him uh, at Fredericksburg. Didn't want the news getting out uh, because it was so bad for the Union Army. So Villard, um, the night of I think it was December fifteenth, eighteen sixty three. Um, you know, got all of his information and snuck out of camp, um, you know, got through picket lines, uh, snuck up along the, the, the uh, Potomac or the uh, Rappahannock River and got to the Rappahannock River. But it was in the middle of the night in the middle of a rainstorm. And several times he fell off his horse headfirst one time into a into the, a mud puddle, all totally mud, muddy. And, and he's thinking that he's got um you know, a, 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 a scoop here. And then all of a sudden, up next to him rides a guy named Charlie Coffin, who uh, was, you know, also trying to get out. So they started down the road and they stopped to slept a little bit. And then they, they ended up uh, getting on a, uh, uh, hiring a couple of guys on, on a boat. Uh, actually, just Villard did, hired a couple of guys on a boat. Um, they, he bribed the captain to get his story, to, to, uh, to get the Get, uh, that was taking a boat up to Washington. He filed his story by telegraph and then learned that um, Horace Greeley wasn't going to put it in the newspaper because he didn't believe it. And an another uh, U.S. senator found out about this, got Villard before um, Abraham Lincoln, who knew Villard because Villard had covered him uh, during the um, Lincoln-Douglas debates. And Villard laid out his entire story to um, to. Um, Abraham Lincoln about how badly the United States um, Army had been beaten and how bad of a, of a general that uh, Ambrose Burnside was. And so that's just one little, you know, one little story of, of many, but it's, it, it tells about the, the challenges facing these, these folks. Um, <clears throat> let's, go to, uh, let's go to the point here on Lincoln's government, you know, during the war, and I think some of you may know this intuitively um, um, or have read it about it, but Lincoln was not a friend of the press during the war, and that made the jobs harder. There, in, here in Alexandria, Virginia, there were the, uh, the, the, one of the local newspapers which wouldn't print a, um, uh, a decree from the, from the government early, early in the war was uh, Union soldiers trashed it, beat, you know, they, they trashed the printing machines. Um, there, there were places in the country where uh, editors who were considered not to be sufficiently with the war effort were tarred and feathered or jailed. Uh, some of them were jailed for months at a time without any charges and just sort of let go after a while. Uh, and, but Lincoln also let generals deal individually with the press. So, you know, there was no sort of overarching philosophy because it was such a new thing for the military as well to have these folks, you know, in camp writing about what was going on. Uh, so Lincoln let the generals deal individually with the press. And as I say here, Sherman shunned uh, reporters. And I think, frankly, for good reason. I think Sherman got a really bad deal from reporters during the war. And I spell that out in the book uh, from one particular case. Um, Grant tolerated them, but sometimes tried to ban them. Uh, in fact, right contemporaneously during the Battle of, uh, of Gettysburg, the Battle of Vicksburg was going on in Mississippi. And, and uh, Three or four reporters that uh, that uh, Grant had banned from camp uh, tried to get back in by getting on cotton bales in the in the in the Mississippi River and ended up getting stranded and rescued and whatever. Uh, Meade, who was the Union commander at, at Gettysburg, once took a uh, once had a reporter that uh, had a scoop on a story that turned out to be true, but made Meade look bad. And um, uh, 
had the reporter uh, tied up, they actually had him arrested, said he was going to court martial him, had him tied up and put uh, on a horse that said libel, hung a sign on him and said that, that, that said libeler on the press and sent him out in no man's land. Now the guy survived, but he certainly was, was humiliated. And as I'll, I'll just point out here sort of as, a, as an aside, the Southern press uh, was generally more boosterish of Lee uh, and his um, is in this in the Southern armies. And um, and Grant wrote a lot about this in his biography about how that impact uh, the favorable Southern press, but also the way that the Northern press, um, you know, depicted Lee as almost this cosmic figure that was, un, you know, he was not almost he was he was undefeated and you know, and he was such a better general than our generals that he that that Grant thought that the uh, that the Union Army. Uh, suffered as a result of it, 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 the commanders, because of what they were reading about Lee in the Northern press. Um, so anyway, I, I, I guess I have like five things that I want to take from this that I, that I think, you know, uh, we can have relevancy to, to today. Um, and that is that this clash between watch, watchdogs and chroniclers, the reporters, the editors, the people that were in the, in the uh, press, uh, versus the act versus the actors versus the people that were making the news was really intensified under fire and I think this is where the um, this whole role of watchdog began for American journalism um, now there were the party press dominated you know the editors were Democrats or Republicans and Horace Greeley was a Republican editor he was he was a semi friend of Lincoln's and, and that sort of thing but but you know his correspondent, his chief correspondent, Sam Wilson, was at times very, um, very critical of Abraham Lincoln. And, um, and Lincoln, you know, who could give it back as, as well as anybody, uh, once called, um, you know, him, uh, or once called him out by saying, well, you've been, you've really been criticizing me, what's going on here? Of course, Lincoln was pretty philosophical about the whole thing. Um, during the war, at, at one point, he was being uh, demonstrated a, uh, he, he was a gun that was uh, being threatened that they were trying to sell to the United, the United States Army the manufacturer came in to demonstrate it and it was in its in its chief characteristic was it didn't emit gas when it shot and and uh, and Lincoln quipped at that point he said well can we also make this machine for newsrooms so you know Lincoln Lincoln sort of took it as a um, you know uh, you know as a, as a you know as a, as a good repartee with reporters and was very good as far as you know letting stuff roll off his back but he was very very criticized in during the war you know he, he, in a lot of news one newspaper described him as an ape um just very denigrating uh, kinds of uh, analysis and and and, um, and attacks on him in these newspapers um and and so objective fact and analysis reporting from people like sam wilkson who was you know primarily a fact and analysis reporter and his his piece out of Gettysburg is just breathtaking in in how it's held up in history, of how he knew what was going on on the battlefield, but he also was able to put it into perspective of what the Union victory at Gettysburg meant in that moment. As after looking for his son for two days, he sits down and writes what I think is it almost brings me to tears when I read it because I know how hard it is to write on deadline, and I can't imagine him writing that story. Um, but, you know, he always had to deal with an editor in Horace Greeley, who was also playing politics on the side. Um, in fact, uh, by the time that the new, um, Gettysburg battle came along, Sam Wilkson, who was with uh, the New York uh, Tribune, which was at Greeley's newspaper, had moved to the New York Times because he had had a falling out with Horace Greeley because he thought Greeley was trying to to go around our government and try to get the French and the German or the French and the uh, English to come in um, as peacekeepers and not necessarily to join the war, but to but to uh, barter a peace. And Sam Wilson, as I mentioned earlier before, you know, who who said we need to win this war at all costs, quit. He quit that particular job and went to The New York Times, which he felt was. Um, you know, was more of a factual, straight, you know, reporting um, organ at the time. So, um, and you, the other thing that I think we want to keep in mind here, and I think it's relevant to today, is there was constant friction between journalists, general officers, and even telegraph officers and reporters and, and journalists. 
And, and as I say, it was messy, imprecise, but I think it's also necessary in a, in a democratic republic. Um, and that friction, I think it's manifested itself a lot in, in recent wars. And it's kind of, you know, how we, you know, how, how we cover wars today is a lot different in some ways, but it's, but this constant friction, I think in, in a country like ours, I think is necessary. It's not, it's not precise and it's not clean, but it's necessary. And we can get into that if you have any questions on that. The second thing I think that I think we need to take in mind here is that the telegraph had as much impact on to the technology, the technological advances had as much impact on uh, people's lives in and during the war, uh, but in opposite ways. Um, and, I, and, and the reason why is I, I, I think there are opposite ways is the telegraph really connected isolated citizens to a greater world at that time um, and to bigger debates and bigger causes. And, but, it, but like, like I mentioned, it was a one-way communication. It was you know, pre-broadcast, but it was you know, someone telling you about an event that, you know, that they had witnessed or that someone else had witnessed and told them. It was a one-way communication. But there's a great uh, anecdote about a young lady at, um, after the Battle of Antietam in Sharpsburg, um, Maryland, in which she says the impact on her was this. She said, you know, before the battle came to our town, she said, we were literally seven miles from nowhere or seven miles from everywhere. In other words, the United States to a large degree were, were these very isolated communities that really, you know, if you were 15 miles away, you very seldom saw someone uh, unless they were family or something. And the telegraph and the railroad changed that, but the war really pushed it along. And the best war correspondents were those who were writing about that. And the only general that I saw that really saw the impact that, that it was going to have uh, on the United States after the war was Grant himself. He was very good in this, on this point. Um, he said that, that the war opened up eyes and possibilities and mobility in a way that it probably wouldn't have. Uh, and some of these folks, including my, my, the, the man I wrote about, Sam Wilkson, really did a good job, I think, explaining what was going on you know, in that context. Um, you bring it forward to today, I think the internet has greatly democratized expression but it's untethered us from some of these um, common good and agreed upon facts and truth, however you define it, um, in ways that really challenge us um, today. And, and so as a result, I think war correspondence work today is even harder because it's more complex, it's more subject to real-time attacks from conspiracy theorists and enemy agents. Um, and we're seeing it all over the place. We're actually at war, I think, now uh, on the internet in, in both in our elections and in our in our um, national security um, you know, theaters. So let's go to the next point. The next point is social media is not an internet invention. We, we sort of have these arrogance of our, of our times. You know, we think we're, we're in a revolution now, we've never seen this before and whatever. And I wanna tell you a story about Amos Humiston who was killed at Gettysburg. And um, he was uh, not unidentified, but he, he was found in the town of Gettysburg uh, after the battle, clutching a picture of three children. And nobody knew who he was, his unit had already withdrawn, all that sort of stuff. Um, and long story short, um, some people decided to use newspapers uh, and describe, this is before the age of, of uh, visual. There were no photographs per se uh, in newspapers at the time. There were engravings and that sort of thing. But the point is, is that um, some folks said, you know, wrote, wrote a couple stories about it, got into all newspapers all over the country. They described it. And lo and behold, um, crowds, this whole issue of crowdsourcing came forth. And some people in New York uh, identified it as a, as a woman down the street as her husband. Um, and they were able to um, reconcile that, you know, bring the body home and all that sort of thing. And they found it through um, newspapers at the time. So, you know, when you, when you, I guess the point here is that when you hear that, well, you know, we've never seen this before, it's revolutionary, uh, not necessarily true. <clears throat> um, the fourth thing, and I'll, and I'll wrap up here with, with two more, but um, war reporting pioneered visual journalism and changed media forever. There's no doubt in my mind. And there was a, in, in, the, in December of 1862, after the Battle of Antietam, um, the very famous uh, uh, photographer, um, Matthew Brady, uh, and, and one of his colleagues, Alexander Gardner, who had actually done a lot of the, the photographs, uh, 
uh, put an exhibit, the debt of Antietam um, at, on, on, in New York. And uh, people lined up to see it down the block and, and for days on end, and it was the debt of Antietam. And the New York Times did a really interesting piece at the time saying, you know, our lives are changed forever now because you, we can't just put this stuff as distant. Um, it's gonna come more home and more home and more home to us as this technology of photography brings to it. And it was a real seminal moment. And I think historians of the Civil War um, sometimes underplay this. And, um, you know, I would, I would um, you can search for this uh, on the, um, the, I think the New York Times article about this, search for this if you're interested uh, about, you know, the description of it. Very, um, very interesting description and very good and analytical description. Uh, of, of what, the, what that meant for people at the time. And the last thing here is, um, you know, this is gonna be a little controversial because I have a lot of friends in the PR industry and I, I'm not, this is not, I, I don't want the, this taken as a commentary on PR per se, but Civil War journalism accelerated the PR industry drastically changing how wars are reported. Um, and and I'll, I'll use an example here again to my uh, war correspondent, Sam Wilkson, um, he arrives on the battlefield and, and literally runs into the commander of his son Bayard's um, unit, uh, the, the 11th Corps, a one-armed general by the name of Oliver Otis Howard. He was known as the Christian general because he was very religious. And, 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 and Sam Wilkson talked face-to-face -face with this general and you know, said, what happened? And, and the general said, well, here's what happened. And here's, here's the battle. And then he said, well, what, where's my kid? And, and the general said, I don't know, you know. Um, but the point here is that it was face-to-face -face conversation and all throughout the battle, uh, as, I, as I point out in the book here, there were, there were the, the, the uh, reporters were interviewing people who literally were, had just come off the battlefield. In fact, there's a very famous quote from a Horace Greeley reporter um, by the name of Charlie Page, who when Greeley um, questioned his um, expense account one time, um, Page wrote in this snarky note back saying, uh, well, you know, <laughs> news isn't free. And he said, if I have, he said, you know, it, it costs to get news. If I have watermelons and whiskey ready when the generals come from the field, then I get my story. And the point here is that it's, it, like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's eyewitness and one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, correspondence and in, in, uh, in, uh, in interaction. But after the war, Sam Wilson is a good example of this. He became, the New York Times correspondent, became a, an agent and a vice president uh, of the um, uh, Northern Pacific Railroad. And they became a, a key figure in the settlement of the American West. And years later, the Wall Street Journal identified him basically as the father of American public relations. And, um, but in that context, as we know all of that part of our history, Sometimes the stuff, the narrative that was written by people promoting railroads, you know, the, 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 um, the rain follows the plow, for instance. In other words, you know, the further you plowed out west and the more railroads pushed out west, the more rain would, would come to make these bountiful harvests out there and that sort of thing. And so, you know, they were oftentimes pushers of myth and fiction in that, art, in that regard. And also, per, you know, pushers of the concept that you, need, you needed people around the actors to help shape the narrative before the reporters got to it. Um, and so I think that helped accelerate the fact clash in later wars between inconvenient fact and brutal truth versus myth-making and falsehood in war. And if you say, well, that's, that happened then, that doesn't happen now. No, it, it absolutely happens now. Uh, as in the case of Jessica Lynch uh, in Iraq and Pat Pillman um, in, um, in Afghanistan, both of whose uh, deaths were reported early on in ways that were absolutely not true. And part of it, it was the narrative uh, that was coming, uh, this, this, this urge to build myth and heroes in war that was coming from the, um, you know, from the, from the military brass at the time. And in fact, I've got here on here a, um, a link to a congressional investigation of both of their deaths. And it, and it really is a very broad condemnation about how um, how much that distortion that went on in, uh, from, the, from the military, from our military, and, uh, and how some of the early stories that were out in the, in the, in the press, including the Washington Post and others, really, really falsely um, portrayed how they you know, either were killed or she, Jessica Lynch wasn't killed, but Pat Tillman was killed. Um, and so in that 
respect, I think, you know, that also pulls it forward to today. So that's, uh, that's the, the crux of it. And I'm open to any questions or any observations or Look, any I want to bring you back a little bit to the to the book. Uh, and without giving away too much, uh, because I hope people will read this, I've read it and I found it fascinating on uh, on several levels. Uh, but at the core of it is really the story of this father searching for his son in the midst of being a war correspondent and covering the biggest battle of the Civil War. Right. Tell us more about the story of Sam Wilkerson and his search for his son. I don't know if you want to tell what happened or, you know, I, 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 think, I don't know if you want to give it all away, but, you know, I want, I want you to tantalize uh, the viewers uh, right. to tell about this human story about the right. father and his son. So Sam, Sam Wilkson, um, you know, was, was um, he arrives on at Gettysburg on the first day. Now his brother, his son Bayard was, uh, was 17 years old when he uh, enlisted in uh, 1861. And by then he was 19 and he had written his father two weeks before this, he'd been put into the 11th Corps, which were they, at the time they were dubbed Howard's cowards. They'd been overrun at Chancellorsville Nobody wanted to be in it. But the reason why this young man was put in this unit was because he was considered one of the best artillery officers in the Union Army, and they wanted to buck up this, this corps. Well, this young man had written his father two weeks before the battle saying, I'm never going to be in another battle because I'm in the 11th Corps, and we're not even going to get put into it. Well, history has a way of taking things and shaping them in ways that we, can, we can't see. Long story short, this young man ends up in uh, his unit ends up in a very precarious position on the first day of the battle. Um, and if you go to the if you go to Gettysburg now, you will see a display that was his um, that, that that tells about his action there. Um, personally, I think it's 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 an incorrect depiction of what happened. But the but the his, but the myth is that he was shot that day with a cannonball that went through his horse and hit his right leg, knocked him off the horse, and that he self-amputated his own leg with a, with a uh, pen knife, put a tourniquet on with a sash that he wore, and stayed on the battlefield for about another 10 to 15 minutes directing fire in, as his unit is being overrun and being pushed back into the, um, into, the, into the town of Gettysburg. He's hauled away, this young man is hauled away to the, uh, to the county poorhouse, where two women, uh, um, one of whom was an African-American woman and who was risking her own life by coming out to help wounded soldiers then took care of him then. His father arrives in the battlefield not knowing whether he's dead or alive. Well, at the end of this, um, I, 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 I talk about this story in the context of the fact that I called it the second great invasion of Gettysburg. More than 30,000 people from around the country came to Gettysburg after the battle looking for their people. And so I wanted, to, you know, I, I told the story of Sam Wilkinson as part of the context of their story. And my story is more about what happened after the battle than what, you know, who killed whom during the battle. And the, the days after the battle were as every bit as perilous, filled with as many heroes, many of them women, um, as, as, you know, took place on the battlefield. But the long story short is he ends up at the, uh, on the, on the night of July 4th, uh, finding his son's grave uh, and writing his dispatch that I described earlier, sitting at the at the um, at his son's grave. And what was it about that dispatch that really hit you? I mean, you talk about it in in the book, and you've, you've yeah. talked about it a little bit here. Is, is there something that really stands out in your mind? There were there were three things. He personalized it in the beginning. He says up front in the beginning, you know, my son was sacrificed here. And he says, I think he was sacrificed for no good reason, because I think there were blunders made. And then he went on to describe in very great detail, very specific anecdotal detail, very specific imagery of Pickett's charge, which is just, it takes your breath away. But he also takes it to a different level in analysis. And he talks about the meaning of the battle there. And I make a case in the book that much of the language that Lincoln used in, um, this, in November of that year in, in the Gettysburg Address came from Sam Wilkinson's July 7th dispatch. Um, this whole um, second birth of freedom, 
um, in, in the New York Times dispatch, new birth of freedom in the, in the um, you know, in the uh, uh, Lincoln address in November. And then there, there's other imagery. There's, there's, this, there's a sense in both of them. Lincoln says in the, in the Gettysburg address, we can't consecrate it here. We, we can't understand what they did, you know, what, what, what they went through. Only they can consecrate it. That's language very eerily similar to what, you know, what was in um, Sam Wilkinson's deadline written piece that was in the New York Times. And so there's a lot of, and I, and I draw that out in the book, a lot of the, the, the similar narrative of it. Um, so, okay. Uh, Trudy, uh, we know, I know we have some, uh, some chat uh, questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, ask some of the, uh, the chats. Trudy, you there? Um, sometimes it takes me a minute to get unmuted. <laughs> can you hear me now, Larry? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. go ahead. Uh, so far, I only have one question in the chat room and that question is, how did the Civil War photography fit in with the journalists covering battles? Um, as I said earlier, there was, there was no photography in newspapers at the time. There, an, a, a, a reporter invented a system where you could, you could telegraph um, stuff to, that, where they could put together maps or they could do you know, engraving images and that sort of thing in, in the actual newspapers themselves. But you didn't do it. But, they, but, but it was journalism that was more shown, like, like I mentioned in the piece or in, in the uh, talk about New York, uh, where they would take these exhibits um, and, and show, you know, the aftermath of the battles. And, you know, I think it pushed it forward in, in ways that, um, you know, we perceived war then, I think, as a distant thing fought by armies that came together. And this war, you know, there was urban fighting, there were civilians killed, there was a lot more of that going on. And I think both, both in the, in the um, text sense, in the, in the writer's sense, they tried to catch it in prose, but there are ways that you can do it. I mean, you know, the picture worth a thousand words, you know, it's not a cliche in this sense. I mean, those pictures that were shown out of Antietam and then after later battles just shocked people. And, um, and I think it was only later that, it, you know, when newspapers invented the ability to put pictures in their newspapers that the two, the two streams of journalism come, came together. But what Matthew Brady, Alexander Gardner and others were doing you know, was um, was depicting this in a way that it, war had never been, um, you know, depicted before, and I think was what took away a lot of the myth making. Um, part of my book goes into why we we always have to mythologize in war, why we why we have to hold them up, and and I'll give you a really good example here. Um, at the same time that that Brady then also went to Gettysburg and showed these horrific pictures of death of men in swaths laying out on the battlefield or whatever. There actually was a painting uh, made of this young man, Bayard Wilkinson, that, that was killed there. His father, you know, the son of the New York Times correspondent, he was killed there. And there's a very famous uh, uh, painting of him that still hangs in the New York Museum of Art uh, of showing him holding his, you know, his sword up and holding the line on the first day of uh, battle and very much de you know, depicting him as this mythological figure that was very heroic to the end. Um, when in fact his death, he died a very, very, very lonely and um, uh, very crude and very suffered. Su he suffered a lot for about 10 hours before he died. But the point here is that in previous wars, that's how they were depicted. Brady, bought re Brady brought reality uh, right to the home, you know, home front um, in his, uh, his photography. Uh, Chuck, you were talking about the, uh, the development of the, the war correspondent. Right. Uh, in your reviews of the dispatches filed by them and what we know of, of the, the, the war, how accurate do you think they were? How biased uh, were they? Uh, you mentioned that the Southern press seemed to be yeah. more boosterish of yeah. uh, Lee. Uh, yeah. how, how did it uh, translate? You know, it, it was a mixed bag. Um, the, the Richmond papers and a couple of other Southern papers depicted Gettysburg as a great victory uh, for weeks. Even though you know the, the even though you know the 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 army was bedraggled and coming home and all that sort of thing and um, and uh, some of them were some of them are, are were really really accurate. I mean they've really held up under history. Um, you know the term fishhook you know has been described in in many history books to describe the Union 
line at Gettysburg. Fishhook was in Sam Wilkinson's um, reporting of that. Um, his description of, um, you know, of the of the attack of, of July third of the of Pickett's and Trimble's charge up up the hill is 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 was the first draft of history. It's it's what we now know about what happened because he witnessed it, and so there was a lot of that. But boy, there was an awful lot of um, you know propaganda, out and out propaganda, falsehoods. Uh, you know, I laughed when the term fake news came up, because if you go back and read in totality about, you know, what was written about the war, uh, there was an awful lot of, um, you know, uh, propaganda, I'll, I'll, I'll say that charitably. You and I have both been to Gettysburg, and I suspect many of the people that are on this uh, uh, Zoom cast have also been to Gettysburg. It's such a vast place. Right. Uh, I, I have a hard time grasping how one correspondent can really capture all of the things that were going on in uh, in very widely dispersed uh, places, but at a particularly at a time when you know we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have all any other kind of communications. How did they know what was going on? Were they sharing with other reporters, or, or how did they how did they cover such a, a massive yeah. you know uh, scene? I think the New York Herald had sixteen reporters there, something like yeah. that. So they were they were they were doubling up. Um, you know, uh, the Times didn't have that many. I think it had five or six. So they would disperse with different units and that sort of thing. And of course, they were on one side; they weren't on the other side. Um, the one thing about the Battle of Gettysburg that was different, and a lot of the soldiers going onto the battlefield have commented to that in their in their um, you know in their letters to, back home and letters to family and whatever is it's one of the few battles of the of the entire war where if you've been there, you know it. It's expansive and it's open. Now it did spread out over six or seven miles, but you, you know, it, it's, it's rather open. You, you know, it's got two, you know, two long ridges and you could see what was happening, but you know, they did a lot of things. I mean, they, and Sam Wilkinson obviously was right up at top of the ridge when, you know, when um, Lou Armstead was, was knocked down because he described a lot of this stuff as, as an eyewitness. So he was right in the middle of it. Uh, but they, but they, but they did what reporters do. They talked to generals. They, you know, he. I think he he talked. He obviously talked to to uh, officers. He talked to soldiers. Uh, there's an, a passage in my book where he he went up to a a, 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 a right after the uh, the, the charge up uh, uh, up the hill at uh, Seminary Hill. He went up to a a young captain um, who knew his son, who had he had witnessed do this just awful work of slaughtering men as they were coming up the hill. And he literally went up and interviewed him right after it as the guy was pulling a, a harness off a dead horse, you know, and he describes this in his, um, you know, in his correspondence. You were talking about uh, women uh, and the, the aftermath of the war, right. the involvement of the women, uh, both during the, the battle and after the battle. Tell right. us more about that. You know, it's interesting to me, um, get, and I'm, I'm, I, don't, I hope this is not a school here, but I'm, I'm actually doing a tour of Gettysburg in November about women at war and at Gettysburg. And um, there was, um, you know, the, the, the crib history of Gettysburg is, 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 I think, depicts women as victims. And, and they do it in, in the guise of a uh, name that maybe a lot of you have heard, Jenny Wade. You know, the only civilian killed at Gettysburg killed, you know, baking bread, you know, with a stray shot that came through. And so it was a way to show that, you know, civilians were exposed. But it, to a large degree, women were, you know, many of whom had no training whatsoever, were at the front lines after this when there were like, I think there were 20 some thousand wounded men left on the field. Most of them, um, the, the badly wounded ones, some of them stayed in homes of of families at Gettysburg, some of whom had, you know, husbands in the army or, or loved ones in the army or whatever, and they nursed them back to health. Um, a lot of them at, at no, you know, at all, at their own cost. Uh, there's one particular story in my book about a, a young woman by the name of um, Sally Myers, who was 23 years old and fainted at the sight of blood. And she ended up taking seven men into her home, four of whom died. Um, and so I go into a little bit about what happened at that. And that's, that's the aftermath that, that Sam Wilkson, when he was looking for his son, went through. He saw all these women coming to their aid. And uh, two weeks before, three weeks before the battle, there had been marauding units of Confederate uh, kind of uh, renegade units that were going all over southern Pennsylvania and, and rounding up free blacks and, 
and people that had escaped slavery and that sort of thing and, and hauling them south. And, um, and, and, and in particular in this book, I, I, I name a woman who I believe, I, I believe I, I found her um, who helped uh, nurse this uh, young man, you know, as he was dying. And, and as I said earlier, she, she risked her life doing that. If, if she could have been taken, there, there's, there's other, there's other, there are other women, you know, that did other things too, uh, that were just, you know, really heroic. And, and this was a multi-day uh, battle. It wasn't yeah, like three days. Yeah. It, was, it, it wasn't like it happened one day and it was over and they, they could rush out. They, right. were, they were doing this as the as the battle was still in progress, right? Um, there was a woman, um, Francis Barlow was the commander of the unit of Sam uh, of Bayard Wilkeson. He was he was a New Yorker. Uh, he was a very good general, but he was badly wounded in this battle. And his wife had gone had gone to the Battle of Antietam the year before. And, and literally walked on a white with the white flag out in the battlefield, got him after he was wounded, took him home and, and took care of him and got him back to health in time to fight back at Gettysburg. And he was again wounded in the, almost in the same place at Gettysburg. She did the same thing. And the second day of the battle, she basically just walked through the Union lines uh, and got her husband and, and saved his life, basically, because he'd been left on the field by... Uh, Confederate surgeons who'd open, they'd overrun his position, just left to die on the field. And she, she found him and nursed him back to health. But the courage that it must have taken to do that, because, you know, there were snipers all over, people were being shot, you know, just by sticking their heads up in town. And it was a bad time. So tell Terry, us. Let me, let me jump Go in. I've got a couple of questions here, if Go I ahead. could. Do you mind? Okay. Um, one of them he just kind of touched on, but let's make sure that it's yeah. complete in his answer. Yeah. And that is, were the dispatches mostly battle details, or were there also human interest stories? Very, very good question. There, there, they were, they were, they were a lot of things. Um, but yeah, they were dispatches when the battles were happening. But you know, um, there were long periods between them. And so there was reporting on movements. There was reporting on, you know, threats to cities. Um, the New York or the Washington DC papers leading into the Battle of Gettysburg were filled with stories about potential threats from Lee because not, not everybody knew what was, you know, where Lee's army was and was he, was he taking an end run around, you know, going to capture Harrisburg and then head south to cap. So there was a lot of that in, type of intrigue, but I will tell you, um, and, it, and I'm glad this, this questioner raised this, um, <laughs> A lot of reporters who, who ended up writing about bat, the battles early in the war became what, what I would consider crusading reporters afterwards. And Sam Wilson was a good example of it. After his son was killed, he, he really went into a deep funk. I think, he, I think he had PTSD and many other things. And he just, he just disappeared for about six months. And he came back, but he came back in part to write about the battles, but mainly he wrote about how horrible the conditions were in, in, in Union hospitals and became a sort of a crusader trying to expose just how badly things were. And there was a very famous dispatch written by him out of, um, in 1864, out of Fred, Fredericksburg, which was basically just one giant hospital from all the battles down there. And he just described deplorable conditions uh, for you know, the wounded men. I've got one more, um, and that is knowing that, um, whoops, I just scrolled past it, knowing that military officers have a tendency to protect their own, even in instances of negligent and mismanagement of military units. How much do you think newspaper accounts of battles influenced Lincoln's many moves of general officers in the first three years of the war? I, I I think it's another great question. I think it's I think it's I think it influenced it quite a bit in this regard. Um, and uh, you know there was a lot of jingoism early on coming out of newspapers, uh, you know, on to Richmond, and and there was a belief that was being put into the newspapers, um, you know, by sources, but also by editors themselves. I think some opinionating going on that, you know, all it was going to take was one big battle to knock this thing down, you know, and the, and the North was going to win. And, um, you know, and Horace Greeley kind of led the charge on that. And, and, um, and Greeley kind of came out looking badly because the Union Army wasn't ready, uh, at least, you know, in, in the early part of 1861 to fight. And it took a really bad uh, defeat at Manassas, um, you know, in that first one, 
that uh, the first major battle. And and I think that you know that then in and of itself, I think really then made um, uh, Lincoln more, I think, cognizant of public opinion and pre and and he he started pushing back a little bit more on it. But he definitely, I think, was under under pressure because of that early on in that thing. And in fact, long story short. That's why Sam Wilson was brought in to cover the war because he was kind of an outsider. He hadn't been part of that jingoism. And I think it was Greeley's attempt to say, look, I'm going to get somebody in here who's going to, you know, who's not going to, who's not going to engage in that kind of stuff. He's going to report the facts as they are and, and then we'll go from there. So, but a good question. Uh, one more question. Were there women who dressed as soldiers wanting to be a part of the war? Um, you know, I'm not all that versed in it. Um, I, I read accounts of it and that I believe there were, uh, there were a few women reporters too, uh, during the war. Um, uh, not very many, there are many, as we were talking, you know, earlier before, uh, this began, there are many more female war correspondents today. Uh, some of whom have done great work in some of these really ugly wars around the world um, over the last couple of weeks. But yeah, there were. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the Union armies weren't just the armies. There were a lot of hangers on on camps and uh, and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, um, on the way to on the way to Gettysburg, by the way, just on sort of tangentially to this on the way to Gettysburg, Joe Hooker was the was the Union commander of, uh, of, of all the Union armies, and he wanted to kick all of the uh, reporters out of the out of his army, and he sent a note to Lincoln saying, "You know, there's a there, there's a million dollars worth of, of spying that uh, you know that's going on that that Lee can read, you know, in these in in northern newspapers. He doesn't he doesn't even need to have his own spies because all the reporters are telling you know him where we're going, and Lee and he wanted to kick them all out of camp, and um, and he and frankly he wanted to kick everybody out of camp. There were women hanging on. There were you know, African Americans that have, been, that have been freed that were following the armies because, you know, they could get work, you know, working for the armies and that sort of stuff. And he wanted to shed all the armies of all of that, but he wasn't able to do that. Isn't that well, a... Chuck, uh, uh, Chuck a Larry, I've got, I've got one more question. Can I, can I get this one in? Sure, and go ahead. Okay. Yep. okay. And that is, as the Confederate Army marched through the northern cities, did they capture any free enslaved peoples to return them back to the south? Yes, as I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned earlier that was there, there was terrorism in southern Pennsylvania in in late June of 1863, and my book has several chapters on that of what you know what was going on with that and and how it was being reported at the time, um, and uh, yeah, there were the, 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 many 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 where there was a very vivid example of one. I think it was Chambersburg of uh, of like lo loads of them coming through the town, and a lot of people in the town knew a lot of these folks and that there was nothing they could do, you know, and, and no one knows what happened to them. So, yeah. Chuck, we're just about out of time. I wanted to ask if there's anything else you wanted to say about lessons learned uh, from the battle or from the, uh, in writing this book, did you learn uh, any overriding lesson that you would like to share? Um, the overriding lesson is I think we get this term, you know, fog of war, and the first draft of history, um, you know, kind of commingled sometimes. And to be, I think my advice to reporters always is that, you know, know the story, don't speculate, know the story and report what you see and what you trust and what others have seen. And, um, and I think, you know, going forward in, in our next wars, in particular in an era when, you know, disinformation is part of warfare now, uh, so much part of it. I think we need to stick to that. And as readers, I think you need to stick to that too. You know, stick to people that you trust, that you know are people that, um, you know, are going to report it straight. Okay. Do you want, uh, do you want to give us a tip as to what your next book is going to be about or is that a secret? Yeah, it's, it's about a, uh, it's about a young woman from um, Washington, DC, who goes to the frontier of Nebraska territory to become a missionary and ends up uh, be, and, and it's 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 about her story and her life. But um, she ends up marrying a native man, and they are so ostracized in the uh, bigoted uh, press at the time um, that they basically went on the freak show circuit. Wow! And, 
It's about their life. So okay. Well, look forward to seeing that. All right. Uh, on behalf of AERP Virginia, <clears throat> I'd like to again thank uh, thank you, Chuck, for uh, sharing this uh, valuable time and your insights about the rise of the war correspondent and how even what happened 160 years ago was meaningful to uh, what we see and, and read today and what we hear. Uh, and now we'd like to get your feedback on today's program and ideas for future programs. In the chat box, you'll see a link to a survey. Please click on the link and take a few minutes to uh, share your feedback with us. You'll also get this link in a follow-up email later today. We hope you've enjoyed this session of Tuesday Explorers. Our next Tuesday Explorers program is scheduled for Tuesday, November 9 at 3 p.m. We'll be joined by Jim Lewis, Civil War and World War II historian, lecturer, and tour guide. He'll be sharing the fascinating local story with roots dating back to one of the earliest confrontations of the American Civil War. So we've got two Civil War programs uh, in a row, and I think that's great personally. The program titled The Mystery of the Centerville Six, 133 years later, a local relic hunter came across the skeletal remains of a Civil War soldier in what is today a well-known fast food restaurant's parking lot. Excavation and exhumation uh, eventually took place, led by a team of archaeologists and forensic anthropologists from Fairfax County and the Smithsonian Institution. What they found surprised everyone. Forensic analysis, followed by a five-year painstaking research effort, finally brought a fitting closure for everyone. Hope you'll join us. As always, the best way to stay informed about our events is to visit our online events calendar. The website is www.aarp.org slash virtual VA. That is A-A-R-P dot O-R-G forward slash V-I-R-T-U-A-L-V-A. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring. I'm Larry Lippman.